Well, hello. Hey, everybody. Oh, John, too, we didn't tell you. You always want to look at this, the one I have my hand in front of, that lens. Excellent. Yeah, that's, these ones over the here, people. that means nothing. So the, and people, the, the, the people are in there. The people are They're in right there. inside Now, the there. trick is, AI. the trick is, like, it's really tempting to just watch yourself. On the multi It feels like you're talking to people because we're right. in there. But they're they're actually they're in there. there. So yeah. do everything you can to keep yeah. So yeah. Haley, your your so. decision as to whether to keep that in the podcast. Yeah, we're or good with we trust Haley's Haley is a producer. Inspiration. She knows what she's doing. You she should put a little head or a little face right above the camera. Well, she has been a guest on the podcast. Her and Chris, her husband, uh, not too long ago. Hey, are uh, they coming back? They're coming back in July. Are we going to get her on the podcast again? You know, we'll have, we're going to have to look because I, I actually don't think there's. I think she's coming like Tuesday to Sunday. Like there's no Mondays we that could she's shoot on a Tuesday. I don't know another day. Okay, yeah. we should. I don't know. It'd be good. It was have... a great podcast, Haley. We you had were, a blast. You were an awesome guest. So we had a blast. Nice. And we uh, speaking of guests, yes. Uh, well, guess we should remind everybody who we are. I'm JB, we'll... worship arts pastor, Radiant Life, and I'm Josh. And then today we have John Herbert. John Herbert, who are you, John? Just some random guy that was out in the neighborhood. Okay. That's, you know what? We've talked about <laughs> hospitality here on the podcast before. We saw John wander around the parking lot outside the studio, and we said, you know what? This guy seems cool. Look seems at his like, beard. Seems like, which, okay. So He's here's right what up I was there with LaBarba. Well, so I was workshopping on the way in. I'm like, is there like a Spanish word for like, because it's not quite as majestic as LaBarba's. But it's thick. But could he be like. La Barbarito. I don't, that might not even be real Spanish. <laughs> I don't think it is. I think if you add Ito to things, it, it, it means it's like a small... Do you speak Spanish? I, no. Oh, no okay. hablo espanol. I was like, okay. oh, this would be great if, if you... <laughs> yeah, you could bail us out, man. So we could just call you La Barbarito. Yeah, which I've been, we're called, gonna, we're I've been gonna, called worse. We're going <laughs> <we're gonna> to <laughs> pretend like that means a little bit smaller of a beard than La Barba. Mm -hmm. See, I haven't met La Barba. So, La but Barba I'm guessing I know who he is by your description. Because Josh Alaba. Well, he actually, I just funny. I just I heard my phone buzzing. Labarba was just texting me. He What's has up, Josh? So, he has a very <laughs> large beard. Epic. Oh, I it's, think it's I know who you're talking fantastic. about. Fantastic. Epic. Yeah, because I beard, beard guys yeah. notice beards, right? Yeah. So don't. I'm like, wow, that's a nice beard. Okay. I He's... have aspirations to have a beard like that, dude. To so, drop the Edo so, and just be a... <laughs> right? Wow. But here's the deal. So you're a drummer. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. La Barba is a guitarist. I play Ooh, bass. Nice. We need to start a band. You want to be I our, play acoustic yeah. guitar. You're a singer. Right. I can sing. And we've all got beards of some variety. <laughs> yes. Like yeah. our first record be called could be called The Evolution of a Beard. Yes. You know, like all the... like the the those fakey like we think we know what we're talking about evolution charts right where it's like the monkey and then it progressively changes like it'll be us but with the beard i'll be at the very beginning i'm like the most unevolved beard and we got you you're, you're the primate and then like, <laughs> that's right i'll be like picking lice out of somebody's hair and eating it like that nice <laughs> nice then so you're kind you, of spilling over into the message la Bar la barbarito and then la barba is like the most evolved. Oh beard. yeah, he's the I AI. Think, uh, he's the transhumanism evolution. <laughs> ZZ Top may have already worn ooh, out that vein, though. Ooh. That that might be how they got their start. Yeah, or our well, Amish you friends. Know what? They're like they're like dying one at a time, aren't they? Like are they? they're down to two guys. I think they I think, are because one of them was That's it. Too bad. Dust. One of them died. Yeah. Okay. So. Mm. All right. So uh, we have a very important question before we actually get into the coffee stuff, John. Mm -hmm. this, Absolutely. This kind of makes or breaks whether or not mm -hmm. this is going to work. Okay. Okay, okay uh, no pressure. We're putting the camera on you. Here it comes. No pressure. No pressure. What's your favorite Star Wars movie? Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's tough. That You guys may want to edit this out. <laughs> I have a really hard time with sci-fi. I'm sorry. It's just too logical. It's too illogical for Thank me. Thank you. I just cannot get. My dad was like the Star Trek, right here, Star dude. Wars, my whole upbringing, and I'm like, Dad, do you really think that that's we real? We are on Earth. This is not real. <laughs> I know. Okay. Well, then, but what's Earth. your favorite genre of movies? Then, um, you know, I like a really good um, suspense thriller, kind of. Okay. But, huh. but all time favorite, and well, maybe a lot of viewers would appreciate this, but. The Lord of the Rings trilogy is mm. like Which is, is so see, good. I would put that in that sci-fi like, fantasy realm. I, mean, I like more, Lord it's of the fantasy, Rings fantasy, not not sci-fi. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's but, kind of the threshold. Okay. But um, man, I've I we have them, and I've watched them. You know, 
I wouldn't say dozens, but maybe up to a dozen time, a dozen of times. And mm-hmm. every time I watch it, it's like I can take something else out of it. Do you? Is it because of the spiritual kind of vein and undertones in the movies that you you like them? You think the most? I I think so. Um, but just the the creativity that you oh, have man. to have. Yeah. Like I like a really good movie that kind of keeps you on the edge of your seat. You know, has a twist in it that you didn't see coming. Mm-hmm. Um, and and just the when you think back of the like the undertones like you were talking about JB and and some of those things that you're just like man how did someone come up with this mm-hmm. this is just crazy Tolkien yeah, okay. to- to- good Tolkien. good stuff Tolkien Tolkien, yeah. Tolkien. Yeah. so in, in the Fellowship right mm-hmm. who's your favorite character in the Fellowship <sighs> I've always kind of went with Bilbo okay Baggins I really okay. like his coming alongside. Um, doing the, I'm sorry, not Bilbo, um, Sam, Sam, oh, Sam, like Sam, Sam Wise, Gamgee, um, coming alongside and being that helper. Okay. And, mm-hmm. and he's just solid rock, like always, almost kind of has like a, a Holy Spirit esque without being like blasphemous, but almost like a, you know, he steers Frodo in the right direction, even mm-hmm. when Frodo gets a little bit off with when, when the ring's yeah. power is starting to work on him a little Infect, bit. Yeah. yeah. I'm just glad you didn't say Legolas. No, you know, because he's like kind of a bugger. Yeah. So, yeah, I was really hoping that you would say some kind of joke. Like when he asked you about the Star Wars, you were supposed to say something like, "I don't know any of the Star Trek movies, but I know that their spaceship was called Voyager." Right? <laughs> right? Isn't that right? But I wish you would have said, been good. "Yeah, if you could have said a Star Trek one, but pretended it was Star Wars." Maybe I if, like to do that. To maybe John. if we so, would have had a cup of coffee before we went on air, <laughs> oh, I would have been a little been, bit sharper. Been on it. All right. Well, for those of you that are listening and watching, like, uh, and if you were. If you have a, a little bit more culture than these guys right here, just throw in your count. What's your, what's your favorite uh, Star Wars movie? But speaking of culture, yes, we are uh, we're drinking a fantastic cup of coffee this morning, JB. What it's, do we got? It's getting better as it's mellowing. Uh, it's very good. I'm really excited. So you, I told you a few weeks back, I won some drawing with Five Lakes, our good buddy uh, Paul, who's right across the way, the roasting facility, and it earned me an Arrow Press, a type of brewer. And then two bags of beans roasted to my liking. So this is an Ethiopian okay. that's light roasted. The funny thing about this coffee, and I need to talk to Jansen. Jansen's the head roaster across the street. This coffee is, well, when when was the when was the coffee tasting thing? It was May 13th. So it was uh, two weeks ago. So this coffee is a little over, it's two and a half weeks old, which so generally beyond is, when you would normally. Yes. And when I brewed it, I didn't get a lot of bloom, but this coffee got better over time. I think it was a little bit under roasted maybe because it was kind of grassy and sort of earthy when I first brewed it, like when I first got it from Jansen. But yesterday I brewed it hot in the green room uh, for the worship team. Phenomenal. Blueberry, <coughs> strawberry jam oh. tip flavors. Oh. Um, and I like I like anything that's Japanese cold poured. I mean, this is, it's just Which my... it does have a sweet, yes. like that that first sip. It was like, ooh, that's, yep. that's kind of sweet. Yeah, so good on you, Jansen. Way to go. I like this Ethiopian. What are your thoughts on this cup of coffee over there, John Herbert? Well, I can tell you guys with full transparency that I was a little bit hurt a few episodes ago, maybe like upwards of five or six episodes ago okay. when when you really came at Folgers. <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. <He's> not, we're <laughs> going to keep coming. Because <laughs> that, that is like my, my point of reference. Sure. Um, so like when, when you're drinking Folgers every day, I'm, I'm guessing that there's no place to go but up. So um, definitely. It's good that you um, recognize that. I can, that you- I can acknowledge that it has a, a way better um, quality of taste. Okay. And so my, my coffee budget may have to increase now. Folgers just may not be able to do it anymore. Talk to the okay. missus. <laughs> yeah. so, so here's a theory. Like La Barba, he's a Folgers Maxwell House guy. Mm-hmm. La Barbarito, Folgers <laughs> guy. Frank, pretty sure he's a Folgers Maxwell yeah. House kind of guy. Does drinking crappy coffee give you a better beard? Wow, I see the correlation. This I'm, I'm really curious. There could be some science there. Uh, we surely need to should, check that out. Somebody should fund a study. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're a little bit off today, but you yeah. know, it's a holiday. We're shooting on it a is. holiday. So it's my wife, Memorial listen, Day. I'm going to go ahead and do this. My <laughs> wife said, she said, "Are you going to shoot the podcast in your swim trunks?" 
I said, and you said, yes, well, I, I am. Well, I said I am because we have a barbecue <laughs> at the house. But I also said, generally, you can see here, you can't see that. So it's they would like, just see it's like burgundy shorts, but they're, y'all just saw it. It's like the, the old Zoom thing where you, you wear like a nice shirt up top yeah. and you've got like PJs or you're like yeah. naked down below, yeah. like that kind of thing. Don't yeah. stand up. Yeah, don't, don't, don't stand up. <laughs> So. No, we have a barbecue at the house um, today. Uh, you gentlemen will be joining us. And so, yeah, I'm just, I got lake vibes this weekend. Generally in the summer at the Brown House, we get home and it's immediately discarding collared shirts and mm -hmm. that jazz and immediately putting trunks on. Nice. And it's one to two to three pairs of trunks that are rotated through the weekend. You just put some up to hang them up to dry and you just get the next pair on. You keep going. There you go. So yeah. it's a holiday weekend, and here we are. Memorial Day podcast. today. So, yeah, it's Memorial Day, which mm -hmm. we pause to express gratitude yes. to those that sacrifice yes. their lives Thank for you. the freedoms that we we have the freedom to sit here and talk about Jesus on a podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that is due to sacrifices that were made mm -hmm. on behalf of men and women in our armed services. So yes, we don't take that for granted. No, so. you'll be seeing this on Wednesday after you've had your own Memorial Day barbecue, and uh, yeah, but yeah. Rock and roll. What episode number is this, John? Uh, I think it's 32. I think it is, too. I think 32 is where we're at. Okay. So, 32, uh, Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. Uh, talking about Acts. Acts. Acts chapter 9. Chapter 9, Keeping verses up, 1 through 19. Which this is actually, like for several months now, this will be our last conversation mm -hmm. in the Awakened series because we're shifting starting next mm -hmm. week. We're jumping into a series on, all on the book of Mark. Over the summer, we're going to journey through mm -hmm. the book of Mark together. That's going to be fun. All our life groups are going to be based on uh, the book of Mark, so you can mm -hmm. dig in. Uh, it's going to be pretty awesome. Those little booklets that had like the scripture, CSB scripture on one side, did you get one? Did you score one? I got seven. Good for you, bro. I mean, I felt a little conflicted buying so many right out of the gate. Hey, you know what? But I'm first counting come, on first Amazon. Serve. I mean, it's, I mean, the rest of them are. You know, they're going to show up. They're in transit. Yeah. Any rate, if you come to the 907 Nato campus, uh, the staff, I don't, I'm not sure whose idea it was, but they got these little books that's like the full gospel of Mark. And on the left side is the CSB of each chapter. And then there's like a notes section. So you can have like this. I'm going to get one. I'm totally going to do well, this. So thing. which the mm -hmm. super cool. Oh, thing. man. And then have it on your shelf. You can grab it anytime. I mean, if you're like the kind of person that uses like hundred dollar bills for toilet paper or something, right. like you could get actually. I think they make one for every book of the Bible. Like, Ooh. so if you just got like a <clears throat> bunch of money laying around and you're like, nice. But if they're the only world? seven dollars, no, I know. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, hmm. very reasonably priced. <laughs> seven times sixty six. Yeah, I mean that is, is a little bit spendy, but if you think a about a little less than four hundred dollars to have that, I don't know. That might be worth worth the investment. So, but it's super cool because yeah. then you can journal, you can jot down thoughts, mm -hmm. notes, questions, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool resource. Yeah, I think Ryan or Brandon. They're, they're crafty. Like, hey, we should Those do dudes. This. Yeah, they're, they're, they're brilliant. Dudes. Yeah. They come up with the, the wanderer and the inventor among us. Yes, yes. And and Ryan's a G. He's a galvanizer. galvanizer. Have you done the, uh, did you do the widget? I have not done the widget. About? Okay. I've done the Enneagram. And, what are you Enneagram? Um, in the Enneagram, I'm a one. Oh. Um, in the I said this, you heard that choleric. Okay, red. Yeah. Red. Yep. Yep. Um, What's your second temperament? Ooh, Was that's a blue? that's a good question. Probably blue. I don't remember. Or were you like pretty down? Because like you were like, yeah, crazy red. I yes. think isn't it on a scale of ten? Well, up no, to twenty four. So, so points, if you actually did, it, okay. so you've got forty points total. But so like if you're anything mm -hmm. 20 or higher, they would say you're dominant. So like I'm 20 blue, so I'm dominant. 24. You know, melancholic. Red. Okay. He's like. I would yeah. have to refer back. I've, I'm taking them all in pretty rapid succession yeah. between the next steps classes because mm -hmm. we just did the spiritual mm -hmm. giftings inventory and then the Enneagram and then the other um, pretty quickly. And I'm, t I'm taking the uh, Wesleyan church classes right now to be. Okay. You know, yeah. to do that stuff. So those are one of the requirements. But yeah, you got a few um, things going on. <laughs> yeah, just a few. <laughs> Juggling a few things. <laughs> on top of which, you're uh as of right now, you're a principal. I am. So Yep. Finishing out my first year in Bronson at the high school, junior senior high school. Right yeah. and roll. Cool. So well, uh, shall we jump in? Yeah. That's chapter it. nine. Yep. So what jumped out to you gentlemen from the message? Holy cow, is that timer the timer's not even going? It is. Oh, it is. Okay. Because I, I saw the 930. I'm like, 
How did we, dude? We set a record for no. how fast we got through all the we did front not. End stuff. We didn't. Do oh, we well. didn't. So no. Oh well, it's cool. Uh, so yeah, Acts chapter nine. What jumped out from what uh, Ryan brought yesterday, guys? Well, there to me, there were so many just gold nuggets throughout that message, and I was reflecting on it this morning, listening to it a little bit on the way over, and there were there were just so many things that I mm. my mind kind of gravitated toward. Um, but the probably the dominant idea that kept coming back to me was the prevenient grace and how I looked at how the Holy Spirit was drawing me to the Lord um, even you know even way back when I was a kid but more specifically probably the three or four years um, right before I turned my life over and surrendered mm -hmm. um, that those times like very specific incidences um, conversations um, even one time a car accident that the Lord just opened my eyes to see it a certain way. And I, I was just like, mm. you know, and when I mentioned to my wife, what I felt like God was doing in that moment, we had never really talked about anything spiritual to that point. And she was like, what? Mm. Like, you know, it was just like out of the blue, like, I think the mm. Lord's trying to get my attention and all of those things leading up to that moment, you know, that Kairos moment of I'm letting God interrupt my life at this point. Mm awesome time of intersection between kingdom of heaven and mm -hmm. kingdom of John and and come to that surrender moment. So I kept thinking about all those times and was just so grateful um, how the Lord had kept me from having a record of wrongs that would keep me from doing things in my life that I'm excited about doing now and had just preserved me and protected me um, so that I was insulated, so to speak, so when that moment came, I could really say, all right, I, I see it and I'm ready to mm -hmm. to surrender. And so kind of a tilling of the soil. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, Jesus talks about the parable of the sower, you know, the seed and there's good soil, right? I mean, in your case, maybe some of those things were like a churning up the, the ground to where when the seed landed, uh, it, it, uh, it took root mm -hmm. and grew. So absolutely rock and roll. JB, are you looking up something good? Yeah, I Maybe. want to, I, I kind of want to just double click on prevenient grace. Uh, so this is from Wikipedia. Prevenient grace is a Christian theological concept that refers to the grace of God in a person's life, which precedes and prepares to conversion. The concept was first developed by Augustine of Hippo, was affirmed by the Second Council of Orange, and has become part of Catholic theology. So I, I was interested to... Uh, to learn more about that because I have a similar, John, similar kind of sense and can see God's hand mm -hmm. in my life before. Uh, but th this idea of prevenient grace does butt into the ideas of, of, of free will, uh, choosing so, uh, some of it. So mm -hmm. maybe sort of ish. Mm hmm. Right, I mean, it's 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 not the same. Like if you look at uh, like John Calvin, right, Tulum, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. total depravity, you know, mm -hmm. unconditional election, yep. uh, all that, um, irresistible grace. It's it's it sounds similar, but it's different. Mm -hmm. The way the way the way that I c make sense of it in my brain, like prevenient grace is, I am, I'm I'm drowning. I'm out in the ocean drowning. We've had this one. Right. We've had we've we've, we've yeah. done this before. So sorry you guys, it's a repeat. It's good. But <clears throat> I'm in the ocean drowning. Jesus comes along, throws me a life raft. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, I can choose to grab a hold of that life raft or or not. I can be like, nah, that life raft is purple. I, I want a blue one. Like, give sure. me something else, right? And then I, I drown. And that's mm -hmm. that's on me. Versus like a total depravity, irresistible like more of your tulip model. I made a rotted, bloated corpse. Dead, white, floating like corpse. I'm, like dead I'm, and I'm just floating dead in the water. In the body of water. Jesus sin. comes along, drags me out of the water. Mm -hmm. Puts me on the deck of the boat. Breathes me back to life. Like yeah. I have zero, zero participation in this at mm -hmm. all. So there is, it's like a, yeah, it's kind of in that middle ground. Yeah. <laughs> to where, yes. Exactly. It's, it's not, it's not all the way like Jacob Armenia is like, oh, nope. Like, I just decided to do this. Right. I chose for myself. Like, there is that work mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that precedes salvation. Yeah. But I still have a, a say in the a choice. In the matter. Yeah. Yeah. 
don't know if that makes sense. No, it definitely does. Uh, John, I like the way that you described, you could, as you were describing your own testimony, you're kind of, I think, remembering some mm-hmm. things, you know, you mentioned a car accident, you mentioned a few things that, that God kept you from. And, and, um, I think we all, if, especially the longer time that you've spent walking with Jesus, you, you become more aware of those things, but it's interesting. I think that prevenient grace is, it seems to be even beyond, I know it's specific to pre-conversion. I mean, I know mm-hmm. the doctrine theology is pre-conversion, but man, I could look Ooh. back in my faith life, uh, even as a pastor and, and look, oh man, I could see where your grace was extended to me before I even understood this, that, and the other, Yeah, you know, and you were just, you know, protecting and, and allowing things in my life that would cause me to grow. Uh, closer to you, even though I couldn't see it at that time. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand it. Um, so I, that, that stood out to me too. Do you think some of that is like part of the, the spiritual maturation process, like being able to to look at things through a new lens and, and in hindsight, seeing <clears throat> this thing that frustrated the snot out of me, that was actually, <laughs> that was grace. Mm-hmm. Like that was, that was the grace of God all mm-hmm. the way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, not, not in the same sense that it prepped me for salvation. Right. But I mean, grace doesn't stop. At salvation, mm-hmm. grace is like a daily grace upon grace is what Paul says. Right. Mm-hmm. Paul says that as you've received Christ Jesus, the Lord so walk in Him. So the same grace and faith that it took the day that I was converted is the same grace and faith that I need every single solitary day to be a Christ follower, to be a disciple of Christ. Um, and it's grace upon grace. It's this cyclical thing where faith mm-hmm. accesses grace, grace accesses faith. Paul tells us. And they feed one another. As we believe, we receive more. As we receive more, we believe more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just goes. And this is, you know, Ryan made a statement <clears throat> along the lines of, you know, uh, Christianity is not, it's not just an intellectual belief, mm-hmm. right? This isn't just me agreeing with an idea. It's a way of life, mm-hmm. right? And it's, it's like you're saying, this is a daily thing, mm-hmm. right? It's not like, oh, yeah, I remember back when I got saved, there was all this grace. That was great. I've been coasting ever since, oh, my. right? It's not, it's not that we need we need that grace every day. And like you said, it, it's this thing that, that builds momentum uh, over, I think it's, over time. It's related to mortality. Like the closer that we get to the light, we'll say, mm-hmm. that big light, uh, the more conscious we become of the just the enormity of grace in our lives. Mm-hmm. Like, because we have this, this pattern of grace that we've experienced over time. The more time passes, the more grace is evident to us. And I think that that's really what was happening in the first few verses there in Acts 9. Saul was kind of seeing in the, t- he could see in the text eventually, you know, hey, this is, this was grace in my life. Mm-hmm. I wonder how he could have seen, uh, you know, how was it grace that he held the coats mm-hmm. of those who st- uh, stoned uh, Stephen? How, how could he see grace in that? How could he see the Lord's good hand in that? That's tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we know that we know that Jesus is in the business of redeeming mm-hmm. <laughs> even the most messed up, broken mm-hmm. aspects of life. Mm-hmm. Right? Like the things that we look at as maybe like the worst memory possible. Mm. It's not that those those things become good experiences. They're not holy. But in the hands in the hands of Jesus, even the worst experiences of our life can be redeemed. Right? I mean, you go mm-hmm. to Joseph and, and I mean, this you know, sold into slavery, all this stuff. He says, "Hey, what you meant for evil, God used for good." Yeah. Right? It didn't mean that it was good that he was a slave. It didn't mean mm-hmm. that it was like that that wasn't His the case. brothers did what they did to him. But hey, like God can take even that and mm-hmm. turn that into something that has, and that was Joseph's testimony. Significant impact. He literally mm-hmm. told his brothers that. No. He said, "What you meant for evil, God sent me beforehand for good to spare your lives and the lives of many others." Uh, so I just wonder what Paul. You think about okay, you got the two great apostles, right? You got Peter and Paul. Peter was sent to who? Oh, you're asking this. Is like, asking, okay, it's not rhetorical. No, no, no. Peter, it is rhetorical Peter, because you guys know the answer. <laughs> who was, was Peter sent, sent to? He was sent to the Jews. To the Jews. Who was Paul sent to? To the Gentiles. Gentiles. So I just wonder whether <clears throat> Paul's just horrible, horrible testimony is past, like the radical conversion mm-hmm. couldn't help him to kind of sit into this culture that he was so diametrically opposed to. Like mm-hmm. he was a Jew, he was a tribe of Benjamin, right? right? A Pharisee of Pharisees, the mm-hmm. scriptures tell us. Like he was this elite person. And so he he kind of needed to have some some yuck, some scars <laughs> from his past. An interesting thing that I've thought about 
in my own personal life and then I see it through scripture. Um, I haven't like fact checked it as it were, um, but I think there's truth to it is like as we encounter the, the evil and the, the fallen nature of our world and we are called to be more and more like Jesus and him giving his ultimate on the cross and the martyrs, um, you know, they're the, hopefully, you know, that's, that's not very common mm -hmm. um, to give that extent, but we are called to lay down our life. And it's almost as though there are certain people in, in life that are given that grace to mm -hmm. be able to endure intense amount of persecution or intense amount of heartache. And they can be kind of that light example to people around mm. who they may read the scripture and see, yes, Jesus did this. He gave this for me. He endured all this. But when you see another person that you might have the opportunity to have a conversation with, and then it becomes really real mm. <clears throat> to say, wow, you've overcome, you know, childhood trauma to this degree mm -hmm. that gives me hope. Um, you know, and it's almost like, you know, if I'm remembering correctly, Paul talks about um, being counted worthy um, to suffer. Mm -hmm. Am I remembering that right? You are. Um, and, and I've suffered a lot of things in my life and there, that, that theme has kind of come up like, okay, Lord, you're going to use that somewhere, somehow. Mm. You're creating in me a testimony. And for whatever reason, um, you're creating in me this resilience and this dependence on you that if I handle it properly, mm -hmm. that that trauma, that difficulty, that terrible thing, I will be able to share in that suffering with you and become a testimony to you, but yet show a brother or sister in human form, it's it's possible. Like you mm -hmm. can get through this, you can bounce back. Yeah. I'm I'm really curious with Saul, right? Because in Acts in Acts nine, towards the end of the the portion that we went through yesterday, uh, the Lord is talking to Ananias, and when he's sending him, he says, "This is in verse fifteen." It says the Lord said, "Go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message <laughs> to the Gentiles and to kings as well as the people of Israel." Sixteen, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. I have a theory as to why that was said. Okay, <clears throat> I want to hear your theory. So. And, and Ryan set it up beautifully. I think when Ananias was told to go to this, this, the, uh, the street called Straight and to lay hands on this guy, and Ananias says what's in his heart. He's like, Lord, <laughs> <laughs> do you know this guy? <laughs> are you sure about that? Like, are you sure that's what I'm supposed to be doing? That might you know? be a one-way mission. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but I think I think the Lord said this to Ananias to say, there, there is suffering coming for him. Mm. Now you think, you think the suffering is in reference to Ananias? No, no, no. I think okay. that. I okay. think the that way you said that, Ananias like, mm. becoming aware. The Lord speaking to Ananias and telling him oh. that this was what was going to happen was was like Ananias. I know this guy has been a jerk, <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's, he's not going to have an easy road. No, of it. <laughs> no. It, it was almost like like Ananias needed to know. It's like okay, okay. There's 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 not judgment because we know that there's no judgment but there's chastisement god disciplines those mm -hmm. that he loves mm -hmm. i think that was part of it but how hardcore right and we don't know to what extent you know and if hey is this something ananias now goes and he tells paul you know god gives him this this mm -hmm. word of knowledge hey I'm, you're going to tell paul man homeboy's going to be shipwrecked he's going to get beaten he's going to get stoned and left for dead he's going to like does it, we don't know to what extent yeah. the Lord reveals except to he would Saul. be bound. And, you know he doesn't he doesn't re, <laughs> you know Acts nineteen or Acts nine doesn't tell us mm -hmm. what that actually looks like. <clears throat> but but if I'm three days into this encounter with Jesus, some dude named Ananias shows up, and he tells me just how much I'm going to suffer for the Lord, and I still go through with it. Like how hardcore is that? Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's, I don't know, that blows my mind. If somebody came to me and said, hey, uh, Josh, uh, here's what I feel like the Lord is telling you to do. By the way, uh, you're going to get the snot beat out of you multiple times. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to you're gonna go through some real, real mm -hmm. garbage. Um, 
sign here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? What I just say? I just finished actually this morning uh, Gary Thomas's book uh, Sacred Pathways. Oh. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a kind of a temperament style book about ways and methods that people worship. Like the naturalist is a person who worships out in nature. The contemplative. Um, and and the intellectual da 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 da. But in one of the one of those sections, uh, it was interesting. Gary said, uh, "I don't think that the Lord said, take up your cross and follow me, and it's going to make you feel so good. <laughs> You're going to feel great about this cross." I haven't you know? found that version yet. Nah, <laughs> Spartacus. That's in the book of Spartacus. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there is suffering in following Christ. There is, and if there isn't suffering, uh, then the, there is some scripture that tells us maybe it's because you're a friend of the world. Mm. You know, if if you're a friend of the world and you don't have opposition and you don't have, doesn't mean we're supposed to go out and be jerks. Like we've we we've talked about this before, but you know, if we aren't opposed to the world system that is is in opposition to our Savior, this King that we follow, mm-hmm. what are we following? Like. And Ryan, not this lot, not yesterday, but the week before, really kind of brought that home in asking that conversion question, examining, mm-hmm. like, do you know? Um, but I don't know if that relates to the divine appointment between Ananias and Saul becoming Paul. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. We talk about all kinds of stuff on here that doesn't we do. have anything to do with anything. <laughs> what, that <laughs> that about. I wonder what you guys thought about. Um, you know, we were in the next steps class this kind of came up and this is kind of a position that i've always had and it kind of comes to life and in saul's conversion paul's conversion um and that is the the gifts and the callings of god are without repentance Mm -hmm. like he he and we kind of touched on this when we were talking about like those spiritual gift surveys and our character makeup and things like that um and he gives us those things like programmed in our dna of who we are right Mm -hmm. and paul was using those gifts although they were slanted in the wrong direction to actually persecute the church but at that time he was doing what he felt was commendable in Mm -hmm. his in judaism um but then when the damascus road conversion you know he got knocked off his high horse kind of um i think he he came into what those gifts and abilities and talents were truly in him for Mm. um and and how so many people might like those gifts and callings are without repentance they have those things Mm -hmm. but need that eye-opening experience that holy spirit encounter to be able to use them for what god truly intended them for Mm -hmm. uh what are your thoughts on that slant Mm. kind of kind of uh well uh alan hirsch he's a guy that he he uh, deals a lot with like apest, like the fivefold ministry. Okay, yep. Uh, like Ephesians, Ephesians four, four fullness, yep. of, fullness of Christ kind of thing. Uh, and he would suggest that those things, <clears throat> those five callings, if you will, mm-hmm. those are hardwired in every human being, believer or unbeliever, as image bearers. And and you can see these play. Out. So like, uh, for example, he would say, uh, if you if you have that 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 innate calling to be an evangelist you probably function really well as a salesperson. Yep. Right? If you're a <clears throat> if you're a uh you're called to be a prophet but you're you're not actually in a faith place, uh you might be like a justice warrior type person. You know, you've got nice. you know, mm-hmm. teachers. I mean, you you've got some people who are really good teachers. There's some really crappy teachers out there too, but I mean, the, there are people that like mm-hmm. they teach and it's like the whole room is like light bulbs. They're like, "Oh, like Francis Chan, this those makes guys. sense." Right. You know what I mean? But I mean, in the in the <clears throat> in the secular world, right? there are very gifted teachers mm-hmm. right so so yes you can see that that kind of play out so the same zeal that in this if this is if i'm tracking with you right paul has this zeal mm-hmm. for the law like he's a pharisee holiness like, righteousness he, he's like yep. no like yeah. these people are stepping outside the law mm-hmm. they're they're blaspheming <laughs> mm-hmm. you know the lawgiver yeah. in in claiming jesus is god right mm-hmm. that same zeal post conversion doesn't go away right it's just it's reshaped like and wrapped and it, in it's, grace and yeah, truth mm. yeah and it's now it's kingdom oriented yeah. he thought it was kingdom oriented before mm-hmm. but wrong, now wrong now kingdom. he's been he's been course corrected <laughs> yeah uh, and it was until jesus came paul's discipline as oh, a, yeah. as a pharisee was biblical yes mm-hmm. until the time of christ 
Uh, John, I would say, Josh and I have used this kind of scenario. It's like, uh, and this comes back to free will and or free choice or or, or uh, sovereignty. Yeah, uh, the will of God is unstoppable. Right, it's like water. Water always takes the path of least resistance. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you if you get a crack in the sidewalk, it's going in that. And if we, if if God, come, if we come up against God's will, we can look at it two ways. Either it's not the right season for us, right? Mm-hmm. And God's will, like water, just goes around that barrier and goes on. Or we weren't shaped to actually do it. It's actually right. meant for someone else, based upon their gifting and their calling. Uh, so I would say absolutely agree with you. And I lean more towards that as I get older, the sovereignty side of things, just to say that what God has made and shaped will be. Yeah. In us and in in his in the world in creation, all of it, he's he's on the throne, yeah, <laughs> irrevocably. Like there's nothing we can do. <laughs> and I think so. that's really true with his incessant desire to reach each and every person mm. with a salvation moment. You know, and, and it's a matter of if we are willing to open our eyes and see, and it's all around us. You know, mm. Ryan was talking about you know, nature and, and ev- like creation, creation screams out mm. the creator, you know? And so he's just, he he's not deterred by our stubborn, stubbornness, our unwillingness. Like mm-hmm. he will, until we can't fog a mirror any longer, um, mm-hmm. he is pursuing us in, in a hot, passionate pursuit mm. for salvation. And, and I love that picture of God chasing us down. Uh, and, and again, those, at grace those moments where i saw god really chasing me down and mm-hmm. trying to get me to see um it's just amazing how how awesome he is and relentless he is no, in that's that. good. now mm-hmm. double click and you hit on a little bit right because ryan talked about that idea how like man it, it's hard to miss jesus right in just some of these ways that jesus made known what are you know whether it's kind of reviewing some of the things ryan brought up or are there things that Ryan didn't say, but you're like, hey, this is one of the ways that Jesus reveals himself. That, let's double click on that for just a, a couple of minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, because he, he talked about nature, which mm-hmm. Paul tells us, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the psalmists tell us, right? I mm-hmm. mean, nature Circuit. points us to God. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it becomes a slippery <clears throat> slope, and Paul deals with this in Romans 1, 2, like mm-hmm. right in there. He says, man, the problem is sometimes we, we, we worship the creation <clears throat> right. instead of the creator. <clears throat> Yep. But creation itself is a signpost. Uh, it, it's pointing to God. What are some other ways that you guys would say God reveals himself to humanity? I, I would say, uh, kind of like John was saying earlier, the, the creation of ourselves, like as image bearers, the changes in our own lives. You know, I can't tell you how many how many times where I've had people that have come to the church that I knew, <laughs> you know, back in the day. And they, they'll come up to me like, I can't believe <laughs> you're doing that, you know? I'm like, I can't either. I mean, God, God's been really gracious. So I think our own testimonies and stories, yeah. um, I, think, I think the virgin birth is a, is a massive, massive thing for us to consider that the creator of the universe took on skin and bones and flesh Mm -hmm. and in uh the womb of mary (laughs) became a person and was birthed and lived on this earth i mean the the virgin birth is and we know that's a core Mm -hmm. doctrine and theology as as followers of christ we must believe it it has to be true Mm -hmm. otherwise he's not he's not a um he's not a viable sacrifice Mm. john well, I think it's different maybe for, you know, as a believer, I look to certain things, you know, I look at things that are a little bit more um, logical. Like I, I really look at the almost impossibility of the congruency of scripture over 400, you know, over mm-hmm. all those years and all those authors and all those, you know, and have no Prophecies. contradiction and everything like yeah. that. But as a, as you know, if I look at an, a non-believer from the outside looking in, um, I don't think you can you can overestimate the impact of that personal story, like you were talking about, JB. Because if if God's not in it, 
you might have great resolve to make a change in your life, but it's going to, it's going to falter eventually. Mm -hmm. And you have people who are in the faith who have made, um, you know, the Holy Spirit's just made radical changes in their life and they stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. And, and our human resolve is only going to get us so far. Mm -hmm. And when you look at someone who's been in the fire and, and has stood strong, that has to point to something greater than what we have in ourselves, mm. you know, to be able to endure the the hardships and the things that come our way, even as believers, mm -hmm. and to be able to say, I will still trust God and I will still um, follow him um, to the point of even laying down our lives. I think that screams to a world, there has to be something bigger, you know, and, and, and John talks about that in the book of Revelation, you know, yeah. we overcome by the word of our testimony uh, and the blood, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, yeah. like you can't argue with a changed life. So yeah. I think from the outside looking in evangelistic perspective, I was once and now I am, mm. you know, I just, that's just so powerful. I've, it's a whole other conversation and I'm scared to double click on this, but <laughs> those I, are the best things to do. I've really been <laughs> meditating, John, kind of, kind of similar on what you just said, uh, you know, for, for, a long, long time, church history tells us that uh, the church as a whole, for the most part, was an apolitical organization. They were they believers and followers of Christ were submitted to government, but not to the place of disobedience to to the scriptures, mm -hmm. even to the place of of pacifism. Like what is what does it say to the world when we have an enemy who, and I'm talking among men, who strikes us on the cheek and we are known as people who bless our persecutors. We are known as people who bind and bound the wounds of those who are afflicting us. The church history tells us that that's what was happening. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the people who took up arms and said, you know, we're going to fight against our enemies, but it was the ones that said, we're, we're, we're going to give a cold glass of water mm -hmm. and bless our enemies. This, this diametrically different other kingdom testimony to the world that is historians say it was strange. Mm -hmm. to to the other people in the culture because that's not what it was normally it's like bro y you get you you hit me i'm getting my pound right right yep it wasn't i want to bless those who are harming me and and i just think that that's an abnormal supernatural yeah different uh response to this kingdom in this world that speaks of who God is. It's got me really, really thinking about my own convictions about some of those things. Yeah. You know, Lord, what what are you what do you say of war? What do you say of 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 violence? What do you say of my response? How are you leading me to bless my enemies? A lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I don't have answers. So, well, None. so now, okay. So, so <clears throat> if, and maybe, maybe this isn't something <laughs> you just said you don't have answers. So maybe no. this is, maybe this is, but I mean, what would you say though, in the case of like, uh, defense of the helpless, like, I yeah. mean, things, things like that, where do you, cause I, I get it. I mean, you've, you've got guys like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? He's mm -hmm. a pacifist, but he sees what Hitler is doing mm -hmm. to people. And this guy who's a pacifist realized I can't, I can't function in my Christian faith and let mm -hmm. and sit idly by while this happens. Mm -hmm. Bonhoeffer's involved in an assassination attempt on Hitler. Yeah. Like that's the, not a very pacifist right. thing to the do. Difference, I think the difference is how we're defining pacifism. And, and this is only something I've become aware of in the last maybe six or eight months. Pacifism has gotten uh, a really wrong definition. Um, you know, you don't have guns, you don't defend your family, you don't these sorts of things. But pacifism actually is a non violent activism mm -hmm. in the face of evil. Pacifism is a non violent activism in the face of evil. You know, uh, 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 Martin, not Martin Luther, um, uh, oh my goodness, this is terrible. <laughs> African American uh, civil rights. Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. Oh yeah. my gosh. 
uh, he was known to say that he would bless the enemies and those who were being violently racist against him by his love for them. Mm -hmm. So he was he was active in the midst of of persecution in a non-violent way. He was a pacifist, but not in the way that we think of pacifism. Mm -hmm. Pacifism has a weird, you know, uh, so I don't I don't have any answers. I only have examples of people. I don't have an answer for myself. I certainly have an answer for listeners, viewers, or for you brothers. But it's it's something I'm considering. Like, where is the creative witness mm -hmm. of God inside of me that is so different and also different from my nature? Mm -hmm. Because my nature is like, and I have been that guy, right? Yeah. I've been that guy to pull you out in the yard. <laughs> it, it almost makes me think we each have a, like a natural threshold of what we will tolerate mm. before we respond. But then maybe the Lord gives us a measure of grace to extend our threshold. Mm. Like, like I may, and of course you get that spirit flesh, you know, Battle. dichotomy going on. Um, but maybe I'm one who might have a threshold at place X, mm -hmm. but someone else like, like a MLK junior who has such a, a, a measure of grace to go to the nth degree gets to be that one who is in that place, who has that influence, who speaks for a whole group Bond of people. Offers. Yeah. Who, who has that, you know, almost, almost like a, maybe in a sense, like a spiritual gift where you you just have like an unbelievable amount of compassion and mercy to be able to use that on a stage that again shows that love of the lord mm -hmm. to people in a in a way that is like wow that is supernatural that is that is a gift of god that maybe i couldn't muster or even trust god for but we want that witness right yeah. do you feel it like even as we're talking about this mm -hmm. like i sense it's like lord I, I want to be living in Matthew 5 through 7. Yeah. I want to be living uh, as, a, as a person who, by the Holy Spirit, can turn the other cheek. Yep. Like, I want to be that person because I'm just not, I'm not <laughs> that person. And I'll tell you one of the practices, Josh <clears throat> and I talked about this several podcasts ago. Uh, John, it's a practice that we've been encouraging. I've been encouraging some folks in the worship cohort to do, which is uh, we took a month uh, to double click on fasting and praying for our enemies. And I, I had shared with Josh, I said, you know, I had some, I've had some people in my life, particularly in ministry that hurt me really badly, hurt my family, mm -hmm. you know, and just really, really uh, marked ways. Um, and I, I knew that God was calling me to pray for these folks, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to not take a revengeful sort of, but also to forgive. Yeah. And I came to a place where I knew I needed to pray. And the only thing I could pray was the deep peace of Christ prayer, right? I could just say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, I lift, insert name, mm -hmm. into your holy presence. May they experience the deep peace of Christ today. Yeah. That's all I could muster. But what I found was that as I began to pray that liturgy over and over the holy spirit began to do a new work and new words were birthed out of it mm -hmm. and i was okay lord and i would think in my mind god would you provide for this person's health today would you provide for this person financially today and it's like oh my gosh this is not for me <laughs> this is because i i've said i've said i'm like i hate i had a hatred for this person yeah. you know what i mean yeah so uh, that's an evidence for me i'm looking at it in my own life i'm like okay god there's a work of grace where some scales are falling off my eyes, you know, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. But I mean, you're talking more like, I just want to, I want to unpack it a little bit. Like you're talking pacifism as a, as a response to a vengeful spirit, not necessarily, again, I mean, maybe this is particularly popping up because I mean, it's Memorial day. Yeah. I mean, you're not, or are you, I mean, go on the route of like, hey, maybe we if you're a follower of Jesus, you shouldn't be a soldier. I, I don't have a response to that yet. Okay. Yeah. I'm that is a tough really one. I, I don't have a response I don't, to see, that. See, I don't think it is. Yeah. I believe there are men and women full of the spirit of God mm -hmm. who are put in play. I mean, think about it. Like if Romans if we, thirteen. If we don't have yeah. if we don't have godly men and women in our armed yeah. services, in our in our public safety, mm -hmm. like the only people out there with guns are people that don't believe yeah. in Jesus. Right. Well, I mean, that's not a good model. But a true pacifism, like, <clears throat> a, a, a true understanding of pacifism still re re respects 
Romans 13. It's still, it's just saying that we as generalized citizens, I am not a soldier, right? I am oh, not no. a law enforcement officer. So what is my response as a person who is not, because what does is, what is Romans 13 tell us? They're called and appointed. God yep. says he's called and appointed sword bearers. So they got a sword, right? That's mm -hmm. Sword bearers <laughs> who are meant to inflict judgment and punishment on those who break the law. It's what it says. Right. We cannot get away from that. But but I think a, a maybe a newer way of, of, of defining pacifism or perhaps an ancient way is to say, who am I in that place of appointing and calling? Because ultimately it's just about like, I just, I'm going to defend mine and mine and mine and mine and mm -hmm. mine versus saying, you know, like La Barba, Josh Alaba, he, he, he was a man who served our community for many years as a law enforcement officer, protecting us, mm -hmm. particularly in the drug enforcement. Style. Like he, he's somebody who, 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 uh, you know, I'm sure it was in spots where his life was endangered for us mm -hmm. to be safe. So no, I'm not saying that I'm saying like, what, what do I say for me and okay. like my home and my, my own responses to enemies? Um, yeah. I don't did you know. Ever, uh, did you ever see that movie, The Mission? Jeremy Irons, Robert De Niro. Uh, if it's De Niro movie, I have probably seen it because I'm I, a big fan. I don't remember. Pacino and those uh, guys. Dad, you can tell me. I can't remember if this is actually based on a, a true story or not. But I mean, I remember watching this with my dad, and uh, it's 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 about Jesuit monks in some jungle type. So I think some Central America okay. country, whatever. And and it kind of follows the story now you've got these invaders coming and you've got one monk kind of lead monk played by jeremy irons he is more of this pacifist like uh-huh we're just gonna love but she knows not i bet well no it's, it's de niro de niro or de niro, so de niro is <laughs> yeah. prior to becoming a monk he was a soldier oh and he okay. says to live out my faith i have to defend the mm -hmm. the helpless mm -hmm. and so he actually teaches some of the the natives how to actually defend their yeah. their home against these invaders who are coming mm -hmm. in to just decimate them right and it kind of teases out these different approaches to living out faith yeah so I don't, I don't josh know. you won't like the reference i'm about to make <laughs> but i'm going to okay. continue to ask you okay oh is this the it is you're talking about the chosen josh josh you're JB. Mi you're missing it brother. JB. i'm telling you you're missing it he's not a fan are you he's, are, do you like the josh is just <laughs> he's obstinate right <laughs> about certain things yeah so the the storyline in the vein of simon the zealot is so beautiful along this conversation yeah. but it's made up it's not made it's up. made up no we no, no, don't no. like what what okay please tell me creative what? liberties yeah. Right, so it's made it, up. It is it's made up, John. Within, within the context it's made of up. scripture, so it is made it up. No, there are like there this. are cultural things. Yes. There are cultural <laughs> things that we can know about zealots. Josh but is getting squirrely in his I chair. Am, here. I'm getting fired up, man. You bring the chosen. You gotta watch it. it our <laughs> You've not watched it? No. So here's here's my beef with it. Here's my beef with it. You can't have beef with something you haven't watched. Yeah, I can. I can because I've had enough conversations. Taste with people and see like this. <laughs> I've had enough conversation. I don't know. I don't have to like taste Coke to know that oh, I shouldn't do Coke. Right? The chosen isn't illegal. Cocaine. <laughs> and, oh, but, oh, but, oh, that gets into a whole other thing. Okay. okay sorry. No, that's going to get us like sideways off the sideways. Where are we Which going? If we go We're 50 minutes in. We if gotta, we go sideways enough times, we actually end up back in the right direction. It's true. Like three right turns. Yeah, right. Something like that. Um, <laughs> I've had enough conversations with people making comments like what you mm -hmm. just said. Oh man, I understand Mary Magdalene so much better. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because we have we have very right. few verses in Scripture. Again, there are cultural context things. Sure, we can learn from that. Yeah. You don't actually know any more about Mary Magdalene after watching The Chosen because everything they did, if it's not in Scripture, we're guessing. Right. We're making it up. You know, you don't know. Was I've heard people talk about all oh, that, dude? That's crazy i didn't know that matthew was autistic we, matthew wasn't autistic <laughs> but he could we have don't freaking know that josh josh like, uh, you, you no. got you need to take your thinking to the end of the line because because just think about it in this in this way if that <laughs> line of thinking is true then there are no expressions outside of the word of god that are valid 
teaching the word of God and expositing the word of God based upon creative capability as a, as a, as a gifted teacher, music beyond the word of God. So what I would say of the chosen is that you are 100% right. Anyone who says it's like canon or like, right. it's, you know, like it's divine. All I can say is that my experiences in watching the chosen I have sensed a greater closeness to Jesus through the creative storytelling. It is not scripture. And I think that's where you are. Well, and I am with my, you. So one of my fears is, right, and and it's because quite frankly as a as a as a as a species uh and particularly within the American church, we're lazy. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, why read the Bible when I can watch this Jesus yeah, TV yeah, show? No way. Right? I mean, it's just it's like uh no, the chosen. And I, had, I had one of the things, it just burned me. It burned me. A staff member who will remain nameless, <laughs> but his name might rhyme with Schmandin Brinzi. But <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> he made a comment after watching to the effect of. Look, <laughs> You can edit this. You right? made a no. Oh no, Haley, you're leaving this in. <laughs> you are leaving this in. <laughs> the rant is staying. Um, we are staying. He made, he made a comment after watching. I don't know one of the seasons or one of the episodes or whatever, and, and the comment was along the lines of like, "Dude, I don't know where they're gonna go with this." <laughs> like, I get, spoiler alert! At the end, he dies, <laughs> and, then, and then he comes back. Like, My guess I, is he didn't really mean what you took it as. Oh no! Well, but, he's but saying the, the creative storyline, like the, the fact yeah, that he, yeah. It's like I was like, oh, you're not sure how yeah. this is gonna end. Well, and oh, something I, that yeah. I'm thinking of, guys, is you're as I'm, zealot. I'm having a lot it. of fun watching you guys go back and forth with this. Is you know, you could say that people are already filling in those gaps with things that may be a very um, limited biblical mm. understanding that their fill-ins may actually be contradictory to Scripture as a whole. Um, the creative liberty that they're taking with the chosen, I think has, what I've seen of it, has not been adamantly opposed to anything in Scripture, so it's filling in some of that guesswork with with right motives, perhaps, I'm, I'm assuming a little bit here. Um, but we already do that, right? We already like try to figure out what's not in, you know, spelled out in scripture. Like, how did this work? How did that Maybe work? Between the lines. Yeah. But you know, I, scholars do that. The warning that, that, that Josh is bringing is a good one, which is mm -hmm. to say, don't deify. And Ryan has said this from stage two, like any of the pastors who get on stage, don't take our word for it. Be right. a Berean. No, the yep. Bible so is holy. Yep. The Bible is holy, right? It is the, it is, it is, you know, John 1 14 in the beginning was the word the word became flesh and dwelt among us and the word was God the word was with God mm -hmm. the Bible itself is this black and white portrait of Jesus himself it's holy so anytime we add to it anytime mm -hmm. we go beyond that which yeah um, but I do think I do think there is place and space for creative interpretation um, throughout our experience with God I mean mm -hmm. you and I particularly I think leaning towards contemplative or, or meditative practices liturgical practices value you know those those mm -hmm. kinds of inputs from men and women that are a thousand years old mm -hmm. you know ancient ancient inputs that is this the way jesus taught us to pray i don't know if it's exactly but man i sense god's blessing mm -hmm. and presence in this particular practice um it, it, we've we said it many times and the chosen is is the it, it falls into that sieve for me. It's like, does it make me uh, more like Jesus? Does it cause me to listen for Jesus' voice and to want to be closer to Jesus? That passes my tests. If it doesn't, then that that goes out the yep. door. You know, um, and Gary Thomas in this book. I know I'm always talking about the particular books I'm reading, but this Sacred Pathways, he talks about that exact thing. You know, in all of these these potential personality styles of worship, a, a Christocentric uh, uh, reality must be, it must be, it must be orthodox in the way that we understand biblical Christian orthodoxy. It must be orthodox. If it's not orthodox, mm -hmm. it's gotta go. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But we're we're so far we, we didn't even talk about who our Ananias is. We need to talk oh. about we need to take a little time to talk about that, right? <clears throat> like uh, that that was kind of the culmination of what Ryan 
was challenging us to where, where did you guys how was god coming to you when you heard that phrase like what what did that how did that land with you I, don't, I mean, I didn't. I didn't have like a specific person come to mind. That's what but, I was But just to. the just the general idea, right? You go back to, and this has been brought up uh, several weeks now in the in the Awakened series, but Acts one eight, uh, mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit's going to come. You're going to see power. You'll be among us in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. So mm-hmm. Samaria. I, I like uh, John West. He's a the guy within the Wesleyan uh, tribe. Uh, he he breaks that down, and you know Jerusalem is your here, uh, Judea is your near, Samaria is your hard. Mm-hmm. And then you know the ends of the earth. That's the far. <clears throat> I think. Mm. I think for Ananias, this was a a Samaria type calling. Like you're called to somebody who's <laughs> difficult. Mm-hmm. Like this is the guy yeah. that's been dragging you to jail. This is the guy that yeah. I'm supposed to go to. Mm-hmm. Really? Uh, no. I mean, I didn't have a specific name float to the surface okay. yet, but I do think that's something to to wrestle with because mm-hmm. I think <clears throat> we are naturally drawn to certain people. Like, I mean, there are people that it's easy for us to connect with. Right. And we'd probably just assume that, hey, Lord, send me to those people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like yeah. these guys. The political <laughs> but it isn't, sides. <clears throat> yeah, it, is, it isn't always going to be that way. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to, I mean, and Paul, Paul has, he's an Ananias to people in the sense that he goes and he teaches people and they didn't want to have anything to do with mm-hmm. it. And mm-hmm. they're, yeah, they didn't, they didn't respond real well. So I do think we have to. Uh, it, it, at the end of the day, it boils down to obedience, which has been a theme on the, on the podcast. It has, you know, Hey, if Holy spirit taps you on the shoulder yeah. and says, Hey, I want you to go to this person. Yeah. Uh, you've got two choices. You can obey or you can disobey. Yeah. Fortunately, and I chose he obeyed. to obey. Yeah. He obeyed. Um, what about you, John? How did that land when Ryan kind of closed down the message with that sort of question and that challenge to, to us? Yeah, I have. So right now i'm i'm really just praying about who that would be for me like mm-hmm. like you said josh no specific name came to mind um i do have a very close friend who um i've kind of been in the trenches with for a while and they are a believer they're in the fold mm-hmm. um and i'm really trying to be a, a good brother to him right now mm-hmm. um and and i don't know if i would say kind of mentoring but really just kind of jumping into one of the the trenches of life with him and trying mm-hmm. to be there for him and and um just being a good brother um so he came to mind but not in this sense um and and really right now in a season of transition um with with some things in my life i'm i'm really open to what the lord wants to do in that sense um i have a whole you know a family of unbelievers or maybe those who um may have at one point in time confessed Jesus as Lord, but didn't have that radical change and that transformation. And maybe the world kind of drug them back in, you know, and that kind of touches on something that Ryan preached about a couple of weeks ago, you know, that true conversion experience, but yeah. wherever that falls, um, you know, the, I, I think the good thing is there's always going to be those people around. Um, one thing that I, and I don't want to get too far off topic here but one thing that it makes me think of that i really loved doing um back before my life kind of got wild and crazy um with responsibilities and such um we would do what was called treasure hunting and we would pray um a group of us like maybe 10 or 12 of us we would pray we would write some notes down on some things that the lord was really highlighting to us and it might be like a place a color um like get like a visual like you might see like a mcdonald's sign or something like that and we would then put together um like this map of hey i had mcdonald's oh hey i had waterworks park i had whatever um and then what god would do with that was amazing because some like all these random i had to color green i had i saw red shoes or you know like i just whatever the lord kind of brought out um and we would put that together and say okay i think we need to go to this place and we need to look for a person that has on yep absolutely and we would go up to a person and we we would um it was evangelistic and outreach you know in in nature um and a lot of times it was um really just coming to that person and and it was amazing what god would do because you could see hey that guy's got green shoes he's got a spike you know belt on or whatever the crazy stuff that that would come to light in one person Mm -hmm. and we would just go up to that person and say hey we have this this map right here that like we prayed about who 
we needed to talk to today and you like have all these things. Is there <laughs> anything that we can pray with you about? And and we would start it like that. Um, and it would give an opportunity. Sometimes it would be, okay, let's ask if they're ready to make Jesus their Lord and mm -hmm. Savior. Sometimes it would just be a nugget, you know, like, you know, I, I prayed for someone who um, had wiped out on a skateboard and their arm was pretty hurt and, and whatever. And so we just prayed for healing. We prayed that the Lord would touch them and ask them afterwards, how does it feel? Oh my goodness. It's like, it doesn't hurt. It's like mm -hmm. 10 times better. I didn't even know God could do that. You know, like, like, an, like that yeah, yeah. Kairos moment, you know, like yeah. God's trying to lead us to those people. And, and I, I just kind of think about that when I think about those people are all around us all the time, if we're willing to listen. Now, of course we set aside time to go and intentionally do that, but it was some of the most rewarding times when you see someone who's just going about their day, mm -hmm. that timeline of their life, doing their mundane things and someone shows up and, and you can say, God sent us here to pray for you. Yeah. And it like lines right up with, I mean, it's like reading their mail. It's like prophecy and evangelism and Word care of knowledge. and everything all wrapped up in one. And, mm -hmm. and those are the kinds of things I think sometimes that gets that person's attention to say, wow, God did that for me. He's mm -hmm. reaching into my life in a moment with total strangers and he just showed me how much he cared about me. Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happened to Ananias. Like he was told the street, mm -hmm. he was told some details, even about the building. He was told how he would find Paul. He's, you know, you're going to find this guy. You can't see, you know, there was all of these words of knowledge, yeah. this map that was given to Ananias. Uh, and then he went obediently and was used by God to sort of start to turn the corner for Paul, you yeah. know, for, for Saul to become Paul. Um, yeah, I, I had a similar as you guys, I didn't have a specific person, but just, a, I, f I sensed a call from God, like, okay, am I going to be conscious and aware, um, to listen for your voice, for your leading, you know, like God, what are, what are, what are you saying? Uh, those words of knowledge, because it, one of the things that helps me in that area is to ask, would, would Satan, uh, encourage me to go share the gospel with this person? <laughs> <clears throat> like, where's the motivation? Is this the pizza I ate last night? You know what I'm saying? That mm -hmm. kind of stuff, like yeah. really kind of, kind of simplifying discernment and being like, is this, is this the, my, my shepherd leading me as a sheep to go do this, that, or the other, mm -hmm. or is this just my own desires? And when you start like looking at it in that way, uh, it becomes a little more clear. No, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Well, hey, I think we can uh, yeah. wrap this episode up. Yeah. <clears throat> this has been episode 32. John, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me, guys. It was a great time. Yeah. If you guys uh, see John at church on Sunday, give him a fist bump. Yeah. And uh, come up, we got to come up with some sort of like La Barbarito salute or something. I'm going to I'm gonna go on the interweb and, and find a word that will work yeah. for me. Because yeah. you don't believe my Spanish capabilities. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> the edited version. I uh, love it. Well, hey, uh, as always, we encourage you to like, share, subscribe, rate, review. Um, write a song about Radiant Reflections mm. uh, and make a video of you singing that song okay. and tag us in it. Nice. If that happens. That would be wow. so cool. I think we should have a songwriting contest for radiant reflections like will because since we're all starting our evolution of a beard band right mm -hmm. like we'll write a version but then we want to have other people write a version of the radiant reflections song and let's see who comes up with josh the is song. a capable songwriter this and is, quick uh, <laughs> guys you need to know this he can come up with stuff <laughs> uh i have my moments i have my moments but uh yeah thanks for hanging out with us uh we went a little long today but guess what that just means you get a you get to hang out with john off to the barbecue guys yes yeah, so we're gonna go you ready uh, have some oh what do you what'd you uh Last night, about eight o'clock, two uh, pork butts at the smoker at uh, nice. 250 degrees. This morning when I got up, they were barked, really, really nice bark, and about 180 degrees. Took the temperature up, wrapped them up, and uh, put some apple juice in there. Sweet. So it's gonna Sounds be amazing. I so hope it's good. We're we'll going to go uh, We're gonna go have a barbecue. You yeah. guys enjoy whatever you've got going on today, and yeah. uh, we'll see you next time.